So Jeff Chester, welcome. You are the director of the Center for Digital Democracy, a good friend of ours and um, really a leader in talking about really important issues like surveillance technology and advertising. And recently you and the team at Center for Digital Democracy have come out with this very significant report called Big Food, Big Tech and the Global Childhood Obesity Epidemic. So how does this tie into the work that you have been doing for years around children and advertising and protecting our children from capitalism effectively? I mean, what companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon have done is that they have partnered with, you know, companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Mondelez, all the big food and, and beverage companies to, in essence, sell, you know, some of the unhealthiest food uh, uh, to, to, to kids all across the planet. Um, you know, we track what they do. So, you know, you can look at, and luckily a lot of this stuff is public, you know, for your viewers to look for themselves. But if you look at the case studies about Brazil or in the Middle East or South Africa or anywhere in Asia, you will see example after example of how Facebook and Google and Amazon, certainly in the United States, have worked with these big food and beverage brands to, to promote these foods, selling millions of millions of, of of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of units of, of, of product, uh, which have been linked to the obesity crisis. I mean, there is a global public health crisis because of advertising and especially because of digital advertising, where on the one hand, I mean, you have all these people who, are, uh, who have fa faced real nutrition problems, you know, not enough to eat. On the other hand, you have in the many, many kids in the same countries are consuming too too much in terms of unhealthy foods and beverages, becoming obese, becoming much more vulnerable to illnesses and even the current coronavirus pan pandemic. So look, even though food and beverage companies today, uh, as most companies are, have become big data digital marketing companies. I mean, that's one of the findings of the report, so to speak, but it's not, not a secret. You know, the same techniques and technologies that have empowered Google and Facebook and Amazon, for example, to dominate our communication system have been adopted by the Fortune 1500, Fortune 2000 companies. So McDonald's is a data broker, Pepsi's a data, they're all data, data brokers. But when they work together, right? And because they're able to surveil you and, and analyze you and reach you in, in myriad ways, most of which is invisible, it's the invisible digital hand. Um, they influence our behaviors, who we vote for, what we buy, what we eat. So that's a very long-winded answer, perhaps I'm burning calories, uh, uh, to, to about what we looked at um, is that it's not just the big food. Of, look, the short version is this. You know, historically, if you wanted to blame, you know, unhealthy eating and the obesity uh, problems, you would look at the food and beverage companies, McDon McDonald's and Kids Meals, you know, Mountain Dew and Pepsi. But in fact, they couldn't do it without the help of the U.S.-led digital platforms. And, and perhaps that's you know, not, not as significant an example of the very uh, 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 problematic role that these digital giants play in, in our global society because clearly they've also being used to undermine democracy all over the world. What's, what's the data show about obesity levels and, and childhood health uh, indicators? I mean, well, the, the, there, there's just been this dramatic increase in the number of, of young people and, and, and families and communities who now suffer from obesity. In, in the United States, uh, it's particularly focused on communities of color uh, who, have, uh, who are both more vulnerable to a number of public health concerns, which are exacerbated by um, problems with uh, obesity. Um, so it, it's, it's just growing. It's unchecked. The companies don't want to do anything. I mean, you know, during the Obama administration, Mrs. Obama tried to raise the concerns, as you will recall, but the food and beverage lobby and the advertising lobby is so powerful, they beat back all the calls to regulate uh, the, the, the industry. And so the, the, the question now is, there's a little background noise on it. The question now is, you know, will the, will the, what will happen? Will there be any public policy 
uh, to, uh, to regulate that. Big digital companies are able to take all of the tools that they've created to market us politicians and, and cars and financial services and, and provide them to the, to the big food and beverage uh, companies. And that includes you know, collecting all our geolocation information, developing profiles about what we like and don't like, using influencers, people who are either paid or kind of induced to market these products uh, to us uh, uh, on YouTube. There's all kinds of product placement. And, and increasingly, they've, um, a food and beverage marketing has colonized the latest media application. So our report looks like how um, uh, you know, big food is uh, found in the games that young people play, such as on Twitch and increasingly on streaming video, which is really the newest platform being used by advertising and marketers to target us. So in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, you and your partner, Catherine Montgomery were effective in getting laws passed to protect children from television advertising um, during, you know, the Saturday morning cartoons where it just seems so innocent now, you know, big sugar cereal was, was on offer. So tell us a little bit about how that work has, has evolved into uh, laws protecting children in the digital sphere. And then we can talk about how much farther there needs we need to go. Well, you know, one of the few areas where we've been able to secure public interest regulation of communications um, has been children, um, but none of it was ever perfect and really effective. Um, it, the 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 um, most of, well beginning actually it was 1990. Um, you know, then um, uh, you know, Boston-based activist. Uh, Peggy Charon, who has recently passed away, led a campaign during the 1980s to re regulate broadcast television uh, to provide some educational programming for children, but also to limit the amount of commercials. And we kind of came in, uh, my organization came in uh, around 1990 and helped what became kind of the, the, uh, uh, the key law uh, uh, called the Children's Television Act get, get, get passed um, by, by the Congress, and that uh, limited the, the, the amount of time one could advertise to children. It was still usually significant. It was like 12 minutes on the weekend, 15 minutes during the, you know, per hour dur dur you know, uh, 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 during, during the week. But there were a number of policies that uh, were uh, included by the Federal Communications Commission. So you couldn't have program length commercials, commercials for example. Um, and there was supposed to be educational programming. Now, that that never worked perfectly. I guess I, the, the, our biggest accomplishment and the one that was the most strategic and which has remained a force until recently was in 1998 when we got the Congress to pass what's uh, what's known as the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act or COPPA. And the reason today that that you might read in you know your 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 might read in your terms of service of online websites like YouTube, for example, that we don't want children 12 and under uh, on the site, or we don't serve children on our site. Facebook and Google will say that is because under the COPPA law that was passed in 1998 and went into effect in in, in 2000, um, parents literally have to opt in, they have to consent to having their child's data collected. Very few parents were willing to do that until, until recently. Now, so what we did, you know, what look, COPPA was designed really to help regulate the growth of digital data-driven advertising targeting children. Um, that was already at the, 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 the data-driven digital advertising was already at the heart of the internet um, model that was really uh, introduced in the United States in, in the early 1990s. But unlike broadcasting or even cable television advertising, as you know, uh, digital advertising is, is far more invasive and far more effective and comprehensive. You know, it can follow you wherever you go. It takes notes. 
you know, it, 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 it assesses and evaluates you. Today, it's connected to a very sophisticated and far-reaching complex of, of services involving artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, and other big data analytics that really get a sense of who you are and offer advertisers and marketers ways to really influence your behavior. Now, the Europeans what? have passed some extensive laws protecting the people in the European Union. You've been part of that. Yes. Let's say, let's say a little bit about the, that regulation and uh, right. the prospects of it happening in the, in the United States. Well, I'm meandering, you're right. So I'm not, but, but so, so we got COPPA passed in 2000 and until recently it worked, but now more and more parents realize, you know, God, you know, we have to, you know, my children want to play online, watch YouTube. That's how I'm doing the dishes. I'm distracting them. Of course, I'm going to agree to have all this data gathered. Um, the, 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 the U.S. advertising industry and media industry has successfully uh, fought uh, what's called data privacy legislation in the United States for about 20 years. In the European Union and in the U.K., um, privacy is considered a human right, um, which is one reason why we have always supported what they were trying to do. Uh, you know, when the EU was created, it was created specifically to address the, the shadows hanging over Europe from both Nazism and communism. And so uh, under those regimes, as you know, right, I mean, it was government doing surveillance, but the EU recognized that the distinctions between government surveillance and corporate surveillance, in fact, are, 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 are really not uh, uh, that uh, uh, clear. I mean, that government can spy on you, companies can spy on you, and both can manipulate and undermine you. So, so the Europeans passed a, 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 a um, and now I'm losing the date, I believe it was in 20, uh, 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 16, the jet, what's called the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. But even the GDPR relies on something called consent. And in other words, you have to kind of agree to have this data collected. The idea being, and it's an important principle, that you know, you as a as a citizen or as a consumer should make the decision about what's gathered about you, not the company. You know, but today, because of new technology, because of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence and super fast computers that make decisions about you in milliseconds, the ability of an individual to make decisions about how it works and, and under what terms is no longer really realistic. Um, so we believe, and there's a whole movement now to, to, to quote, ban what's called surveillance advertising. This data that's collected about you that understands your behaviors is in fact surveillance. And, and, and there are groups in the United States and Europe and elsewhere calling for the end of it, to ban it. And to find a different, look, we did not have to take advertising as a business model for the internet. And, um, and, and there were a number of people that thought A, it would never happen and, or that, you know, uh, uh, you could regulate it. Well, we know from the history of media in the United States that advertising is the dominant way that, that the media system is constructed and operated. So what happened in the early 1990s was that the advertising and, and marketing industry were able to completely shape the evolution of the internet, defend against any regulation. So now you have the most powerful advertising system ever created. And because the, the, the U.S. companies dominate the commercial internet, internet and dominate really the global marketplace with the exception of China, like Google and Facebook, we have exported our surveillance and manipulation business model to every country on the planet. And, and none of these companies are constrained by anything, right? They are daily expanding their ability to, to manipulate us and to gather data about us in, in so many ways. So, but now we're at a moment in time in the United States when there's been kind of a great awakening. Uh, up until the 2016 election, a lot of uh, progressives, frankly, thought that Google and Facebook were our, were the, was a friend of democracy. We, 
at the Center for Digital Democracy, and I'm sure from many of your viewers, have always recognized that really Google and Facebook are just another form of News Corp or CBS or you know, the old radio networks, just the latest form of commercial media that only has profits, uh, not the health of our democracy in mind. But there is a movement to regulate them, and, um, and we hope that uh, they will be successful. Well, you know, we were talking before about the breakup of AT and T and the, you know, the the breakup of monopolies. But now we see that, despite that breakup, there's this conglomeration again. And it seems to me that, given the economic order, you know, there's always this deregulation, regulation. I mean, for the last hundred years since mass media existed, there has been this these cycles. So what makes us think that any effort to regulate is going to last in a meaningful way? Well, I mean, I would also d d defer to you because you're also a scholar of all this, Lauren Glenn, but I don't think we've ever did a very good job regulating. I mean, the whole, it's, it's been, a, it's, you know, uh, I'm part of a movement and so are you. I hope, I'd be interested in your reaction. We're part of an historic failure. I mean, in 19, in the early 1930s, you know, we, we wanted to reserve 25% of the spectrum for a public interest use, right? The Wagner Hatfield Amendment. We lost that and radio became a huge commercial enterprise. Um, we weren't really able to regulate broadcast television. I cut my teeth as you did in trying to regulate cable television. And, you know, and if you look at who owns what or your monthly bill that you get, you know, uh, you will see we, we, we didn't win uh, very, very, very much. The fact that the only privacy law we can get out of the United States was on kids. That was in 1998. We couldn't do that again today, it's easily in some ways, you know, sa 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 says a lot. So, so I don't think we ever regulated very well. Um, and, uh, and our country, I think, you know, has shown what the implications are. You know, if you look at the growth of Fox News and the fact that they were able to, to create this huge network that's now kind of focused on disinformation, they did that with the, in, in cahoots with the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and, you know, and the Democrats might have wanted to regulate more, but they were always very conflicted and corrupted, frankly. But by, yeah. by who funded their campaigns? You yeah, mean? or the revolving door. Yes, exactly. You know, I mean, I always said, you know, which congressperson's going to, when it, well, you know, whenever the, the congressperson always knew in the old days that, you know, they, their reelection would depend on the coverage they would get from their local television station. Well, today it depends on their ability to effectively leverage Facebook and YouTube, right? So there's a huge conflict of interest there. And, 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 and there's a huge conflict of interest in our society about really capitalism and the best way to regulate capitalism. But there has been a sea change and, and it's incredibly promising. But the question is how successful we will be. You know, when 2016 happened and Cambridge Analytica organizations and, and foundations that up until then were basically not critical of Google, Facebook, and the commercial digital culture, started funding alternative organizations, uh, uh, opposition uh, 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 movements, and, 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 and groups that had not been as critical of the digital media industries, such as the civil rights community, um, are now speaking out. So you have many, many more critics out there. Uh, some are better funded. And um, there's a real dedication to make change. Uh, it's increasingly global. You know, there are movements in all across the world to regulate it. So we have our best chance that we've had in at least, you know, 20, 30 years to do something. The question is, will we do it? You know, what, what will really happen? Um, I think it's too early to, to, to see. And these companies are huge and powerful and they have so much money. And the system is still so corrupt. What are the recommendations in the report on obesity and children and big food and big tech that you make? Well, frankly, we don't think that any of the, uh, uh, there, there are ways of identifying uh, which foods are unhealthy. And frankly, none of the food and beverage companies or the, or the platforms, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, should in fact promote those foods. Um, they, should, they simply sh shouldn't. Um, and especially in the ways that they do, using the data, doing the targeting, uh, uh, you know, this stealth product placement, 
et, et cetera. Um, they should not be doing uh, uh, various advertising practices, uh, pushing these unhealthy foods, um, the use of influencers, um, you know, using our geolocation information. So for example, um, you know, companies like Google, which owns Waze, they will know, let's say that, that Waze is working with McDonald's, which it does. Google's Waze works with McDonald's or even Burger King. And when you're driving by one of the fast food outlets, you know, Google is alerted through your mobile phone and then you get a coupon saying, come right over, we'll give you a discount. None of those tactics are fair. Companies should not also be using um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and things like emotional analytics to understand how to influence our unconscious and subconscious behaviors. So we have a number of recommendations that we'd uh, like to see. And this once again is kind of a test case. If we can't pr protect the most vulnerable and it's in our self-interest, frankly, not to foster a generation of young people in the United States and all over the world who are going to face serious health consequences in the future, tragic for them, but has consequences for what we pay in terms of our healthcare costs. If we can't do that, then it says a lot about our commitment for a fair, just digital democratic society. Who, who are the allies in this work, Jeff? Well, I was gonna say you, I'm Glenn, and that was, no. Um, the, the, um, our, well, we have, there are public health organizations uh, that, are, that care about this, most notably the Center for Science and the Public Interest, which has been the champion of healthy nutrition for, 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 for decades. Um, and there are other public health organizations, but you know what, more or less, uh, we still, despite the fact that I say that we have a, a new movement going to regulate the digital platforms, um, it's, it's, it's not as deep as it could be. And um, there's a lot of anger focused on Google and Facebook and Amazon as it should be. But, um, uh, but, but the focus isn't kind of on breaking those companies up without necessarily examining closely like we do in this report, how these platforms operate under particular sectors. Um, and so, it's not, yeah. I mean, isn't this work a little difficult because so many of the public interest groups are funded by Google? Well, a lot of, yeah, well, I mean, increasingly that's, increasingly there are groups that are completely independent, but historically one of the things that's kept us back as a public, as a media reform community in the 21st century has been that Google and Facebook have their tentacles in all these public interest organizations and all these think tanks. And, uh, you know, and let alone a revolving door between those officials in Washington and these, and these companies. And, and that's, that's been a real uh, uh, a problem. Um, so I don't know, look, I, our report has been actually better received in Europe where there is interest in regulating these companies mm -hmm. than in the United States. So, uh, but look, if things change in Europe, if Google and Facebook and McDonald's and Pepsi have to operate differently in Europe, then we can say, well, if you're protecting children there, why not protect children here? Um, but there's a long road ahead, I think. Um, we've Are been you, not to interrupt you, but is the Biden administration promising in this regard? Do you see some opportunities with the politics of this administration? Well, I think it's too early to tell. I think the uh, Biden administration um, has appointed, and she's waiting Senate confirmation, a, um, a, a highly regarded uh, a digital expert to be on the Federal Trade Commission, a professor named Lena Khan. Um, however, you know, the next appointment that the president makes will determine the composition of the FTC, if not it, who will lead it. And the, the, the FTC could easily fall into the same um, behaviors it's fallen into under previous democratic administrations, which is basically to let big digital data grow uh, unimpeded. So it's too early to see if they have a commitment on it, frankly. So this study that you did, Big Food, Big Tech and the Global Childhood Obesity Crisis uh, was funded largely by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, is that right? Yes, they, they have been the, they've been the key funder of, of our work uh, uh, on digital marketing um, for a number of years. And that, and, and why do they care? 
Well, I. I mean, do they fund health care? Yeah, they, fund, they look. Robert Wood Johnson is probably the leading foundation. I mean, perhaps with Bloomberg Philanthropies and obviously the Gates Foundation too, that that, that focused on 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 health care and 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 making health care equitable. Um, to be honest with you, I I think there was you know, we're still people still don't appreciate a lot the role that digital media play in influencing the behavior of, of individuals. Just look at the political sphere, even with Cambridge Analytica, you know, and part of it is the, is the political divide, but there's not been real calls to kind of regulate the role that data plays in political campaigns and, and trying to make it more fair and equitable and get rid of those advertising. Look, the same advertising practices that drive junk food marketing drive political you know, behaviors uh, online. Um, so um, there, there, there's, you know, I, I would say that we're kind of still pioneers in, and, and this is not for self-aggrandizement. I mean, if you ask me whether uh, we gave this, we did this on the, with the support of the foundation, which we're very gr grateful, but whether or not the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or other foundations really recognize that they need to seize control at this moment about the future of the digital media and, and, and challenge uh, the course that the industry is taking and force it to become much more diverse and democratic. If we don't do that now, then our hopes for a better uh, digital media future, I think, uh, will um, be frustrated. And, and I think the consumers need to have a better understanding because we benefit from the convenience of these systems of surveillance that serve up things that we think that we want. Um, but I think we're less critical and aware that it's that it's happening, right? Yeah, and yeah, and 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 then what are you going to do about it? You know, but you're but you're absolutely right. Consumer education is key. I mean, we at Center for Digital Democracy, and as you know, well, in some ways, our constituency has actually been the policymakers and the news media who are still unaware. Just today, I had to send something to the Federal Trade Commission about the Amazon MGM deal, where there was a, had a sense of kind of less criticality. I mean, because that deal, although it's not as significant as, you know, Facebook buying Instagram or WhatsApp, for example, but it all hinges on data collection. It, it, it involves the future of the streaming market and how this, of where Amazon has developed a very considerable position. And, and, by, and you have to look at that deal through the data assets that Amazon hopes to bring through, you know, through owning, because, because MGM is, is more than James Bond. It's a number of studios, a number of other commercial properties. But you, know, you still have to kind of remind these people uh, to be, and this is, I, uh, to be critical, so. And what is, what is, just describe a little bit more detail, what does MGM have besides the James Bond franchise that Amazon wants? Well, they have, they have many, many titles. I mean, you know, they, they, they I mean, they own MGM Studios and they, they own um, United Artists, certain, they own a bunch of films actually and media properties. Um, that will uh, uh, be used uh, to bolster um, Amazon's Amazon Prime and uh, Amazon's ad-supported uh, uh, activity. And uh, interestingly, and if your viewers want to see, last December, uh, Amazon and MGM, uh, you know, developed a deal prior to the merger where Amazon's uh, 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 cloud computing service, AWS was going to help MGM leverage data for more effective targeting to anticipate our needs, to figure out where the advertising should be. So, you know, you, you, ha you have to look at all that. I mean, you, you might say, okay, the merger will be approved, but we're not gonna let you have access to all that data. Or, to, or, or, or we're not gonna let you merge the data that we get from when you shop on Amazon, if you go to, Whole Foods, if you view our streaming stuff, and then if you do anything with with James Bond, we're not going to let you have all that leverage, all that, given where you are in the in the in the marketplace. Look, there's no, you know, uh, one has to analyze uh, uh, this more 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 closely. But today, the big media mergers are really data deals, in my view, right? And that's, and that's what we have to look at. That's where the power is. 
and the regulators haven't been looking at it, let alone the privacy aspects. So just say a little bit more to educate our viewers about what that means, the data deal. Well, you know, the, 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 I'm trying to get, I'm trying, I'm trying to use a, a good example. Well, for example, even in the discovery Warner Media deal, right? And, and if, which by the way, for those of your viewers who are, you know, cable advocates involves Liberty Media, which used to be TCI, you know, so, but, 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 you know, what you're talking about is um, discoveries has a lot of information about its viewers or if you watch it on television, but also online. Warner Media is part of a huge complex of digital advertising uh, uh, resources. And so they're gonna merge the two, more information about you, greater ability to predict what you watch, what you buy, where you go, how you behave, no limits on what they can do when they leverage all that data and you know help advertisers take it take advantage of it. So you, what you're really seeing also now, Lauren Glenn, which has been consistent actually over the last ten or fifteen years, but it, there's a spate of them now, is you're seeing this you know more and more consolidation going on in the digital data industries. More and more data digital data companies are are, are merging consolidating their resources so they have and, and partnering with everybody else so they have much more they have greater ability to really um, know who we are and figure out ways of getting to us and then selling that selling that information to political marketers or food marketers if it's not selling directly because that you know it's 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 basically leveraging their assets they will they will say to the local campaign look we know where you're uh, target a uh, voter is hire us and we'll reach them right. and we'll be able to reach them because we partner with everybody else so you know i mean that and that is illustrates i guess the question here for the biden administration which is a very slim majority and in, in, in congress and right for the moment and ha is ambivalent i'm sure about how well to regulate these folks how well wh whether to regulate these folks is that the digital industry is really you know highly interlocked with a handful of giants but with but but with other other big companies that have now developed alliances with many many others it's a very small club that can that that really controls the, the future of the digital uh, uh media system and whether or not we're going to you know try to break that up or create some fairer rules and safeguards remains a question well jeffrey thank you so much it's always inspiring even though sometimes a little depressing um, to talk with you about what's happening in the world of the surveillance advertising and especially how it's affecting our children and, and children of color and just, you know, across the world. So I really am going to encourage folks to um, follow the link that I'll post to Big Food, Big Tech and the Global Childhood Obesity Epidemic and really to follow your work at Center for Digital Democracy because you do quite a bit to lift the lid on what's happening. And also not only are you lifting the lid, but you're informing, as you said, the policymakers and the media folks so they can be better educated in the decisions that they make as thank well you. as our own. So thank, thank you. you so much. Well, your organization is also an inspiration to me, so. Thank you. Well, we have the Mutual Admiration Society. Us media activists, we have to stick together. You got it. At least thank there's two you so of us. Much. <laughs>